Good afternoon. And I thank you for your loyalty staying this late. <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking about using machine learning models for prediction of highway pavement uh, performance. Uh, my background is in civil engineering. And just um, to let you know, if you look at all engineering, civil uh, is probably the least uh, quantity, what do you call it, numerical. Uh, we have mechanical, electrical, chemical, they are very, very quantitative. We also are quantitative when we design bridges and stuff like that. So anyway, um, super engineering, the reason I'm saying all this is because our stakeholders are kind of different from most of the uh, industries because if you look at the uh, transportation department, the city halls, they're mostly people who are not, I won't say technical, like you have like in um, Mag Lab. So the point is when we talk about technology transfer, we have to have a way of actually communicating our results. So what I'm going to talk about today is going to be a little bit in the general audience, where you're going to see some of the technical contents. So, um, okay, let me use this. So just an outline, I'm going to talk about how significant the issues of roadways are in the US. Everybody sees about, uh, you hear about potholes and all these issues on the roadways. I'm gonna give a little overview of machine learning models and also talk about how we currently use math models to model pavement performance, um, mostly regression and stochastic models. Also, I'm gonna talk about some of the traditional machine learning techniques we use. And lastly, I'm gonna go into the new ways, uh, new approaches being recommended um, and then I will summarize. So um, everybody familiar with the infrastructure bill, which uh, was passed um, in last year, and uh, very important. And one of the issues that has to do with repairing roadways and bridges. So um, it's something that is of concern to everybody, uh, more so if you live in the northeastern part of the US, like New York, Austin, they have very, very bad roads. Uh, Luckily in Florida, because we pay a lot of money, <laughs> so our roads and bridges are relatively better. But at the same time, that kind of tells you we need to have good models to be able to predict how these roads and bridges are going to be uh, deteriorating. And I put some of these um, the, uh, bullets because there's so much data being collected. I don't know if you travel on the roadways and sometimes you see speed limits, um, speed is being monitored by, you know, like satellite. There's so much data being collected almost every minute on the interstate. The, the speed of your vehicle, the weights of some of those trucks, tons of data that could be used to make decisions. So the first one is the, we we'll call it LPPP, is a, what we call a long-term payment performance. I'm going to talk about it. Also, there's the bridge performance. And all the state agencies and cities keep tons of data on their pavements and the traffic. So the transition bill, uh, I already mentioned that. People still complaining that only one and ten billion was allocated to the roads and bridges. I think they should have gone more than that uh, because there's so much need to repair our roads and bridges. Well, TPP, which is what we using uh, me and my PhD are using for research a lot, is a huge uh, database being um, organized by the Federal Highway Administration, and it collects data. I don't know if you can see the graphics here. You have. Things uh, including drainage, uh, the construction information on these pavements, and also uh, distress means cracks and potholes and things you see on the roadway. Traffic data, uh, you have profile, the slope, the grade, and um, a lot of things that uh, is not even shown here. And then we have climate also. We collect data on climate, the load from the trucks, the axle loads, and all the other important things. And I just put this bridge here. I'm not going to talk about bridges, but this is also a ton of information that you collect. Uh, it's been stored for many bridges in the U.S. over many years that you can actually use to um, do research on them. When you say bridge performance, that's something people use at the same time as bridge deterioration. Deterioration means how it's going to, when the island is going to last before you have to replace it or you have to repair it. So these are very good information that actually I, I do research with some of this data too. And so back to uh, what we're talking about today, machine learning. Uh, I know the audience here, I've seen more than probably 50% are computer science and data uh, science experts. I just put this here in case uh, for general audience, just to give you an overview, what is AI, what is ML, and what is deep learning. 
which I think most people are probably already know here. And this chart, I got it from a, uh, a source, kind of trying to explain um, what's machine learning, the types of machine learning, uh, supervised and supervised reinforced learning, and regression and clustering and all the other stuff. So this, I don't expect to be able to read this, <laughs> uh, but it's a very good reference, which I think very comprehensive, talks about just types of um, machine learning in terms of the algorithms and can see some overlaps uh, and some of the things I've mentioned earlier. But I find it to be very, very comprehensive, uh, trying to cover almost all the techniques that you can um, think of. Uh, so it's, um, are you gonna make the slides available? Are you gonna are you gonna give the PowerPoint slides to everybody or not? Yes. Okay. So, so this will be available. So what what do we use machine learning for? In sometimes it's civil engineering, you have transportation, you have um, drainage and stuff. There are so many ways we use machine learning. The most common and the most I'll say effective way is image processing, because we see things, for instance. Recognizing people, uh, you know, uh, pedestrians in safety issues. The one that's close to what I'm talking about today is image processing, because typically we inspect roadways by looking at it and quantifying the length of the cracks or potholes. But actually, you can scan these images and actually quantify those damages. And that's actually one of the most popular applications right now. Inspecting not only pavement, but bridges also using drones. They actually take those pictures, high resolution, or even thermal pictures, and process it to actually quantify uh, those defects. We also use for safety. In this safety issue, you can see where um, there are an accident, and they have crashes that happen on the roadway, and this model actually tries to look at the severity of the injuries using so many uh, ML techniques, and, and they, they, they give you very good results. And one way I didn't mention also is autonomous vehicle is also um, a very common application of ML in transportation. So back to our, our topic, we inspect roadway distress by, I would say more than right now, 70% is still manually collected, meaning that you, you send inspectors out, they actually quantify those defects, potholes. The first one you see is very poor. The, the, the one on the lower right is very good as excellent. They assign numeric uh, ratings to them. Like I said, maybe 20, 25% right now use automated video scanning and image processing to quantify these uh, values. So you can see from the last screen, what you do is that you actually inspect those roadways, assign for each segment, uh, whether it's a zero or a five, excellent, or something you have a 10 for the excellent. So you keep this data over several years and look at the age uh, that the, the people have been in service and try to have a model uh, ready to time. We can use those models to predict how long those uh, pavements are going to last. So you can see uh, the history of doing this started with using a simple linear model, regression model, went to a non-linear regression model, you can see on the curve on the left, and uh, we use those. And now we move into more sophisticated uh, stochastic models like Markov chain, which I tried to exemplify in the uh, transition diagram you see on the top right. What it means is if you have a pavement that could be in three states of condition uh, in one year, there's a 95.3% is going to stay good. There's a 4.6% is going to deteriorate to the next lower state. And there's also a 1%, 0.1% probably of going to even a worse state. So if you mathematically uh, store this data, you can use it to predict uh, which state is going to be in the five years or 10 years. That's a common uh, model being used. Many of the agencies right now have programmed uh, models, computer program software that actually are based on this. Uh, this has been proven to like semi-Markov process, which is a little bit more advanced. And um, also we use reliability model. You can see the bad curve uh, picture at the bottom, which I think if you do a lot of um, stochastic model, you're probably familiar with that. It's basically looking at how long it takes for the components to fail. And using those failure times, you can use it to predict uh, the life of the uh, pavement segment. So um, a few years back, um, one of my students, uh, he, he did, we actually tried using machine learning uh, techniques to pavement uh, deterioration, and we actually used Florida data. And I'm not explaining a lot of details here, but it became, it was very, very good. It gave us very good results. 
And you can see the, co the comparison here using averages, uh, some of the pavement segments, there were actually five. Using those seven uh, different algorithms, we actually got something very close to the actual uh, values. And this is just a distribution of the um, results at each of those uh, using those methods. And I think uh, the best method was the PNN uh, to give us the best R squared. So now uh, we have an ongoing study with my PhD who is here. We're actually trying to use a more advanced machine learning technique along with other things. And we're using that data, I've shown you before, we're using the LTPP data. And we are focusing on the southeastern region of US um, that we, we actually have data collected. And this is amazing because they have data on how these sections were constructed and um, how long they've been maintained, how much traffic is being traffic using them, and also the measure cracks every uh, period to see the extension of the cracks. And these sections were left intentionally not repaired. So you can see how long it's going to take for them to fail. So this is just um, is a snapshot of the variables we are looking at. And one thing also unique about our research is most of the models, I've seen more than 99%, actually use data of when the, the pavement was constructed after it and then monitor it. We are trying to actually, we have a hypothesis that the quality of the construction is very important also. We're looking at what happened during the construction, um, how long, because you can see the layer on the right, that's your typical uh, roadway. In the roadway, after, in the ground, you have your sub base, you have a base, and then you have the dark asphalt concrete that you see on the top. And after a while, they put, put overlay on those um, roadway. So we look at so many unique construction uh, attributes. There's something called air voids, meaning we actually have your concrete, the, the one on the dark surface. Um, if it's not compared to be 100% uh, solid, they have some air voids in them. And sometimes the amount of air voids in there actually may indicate the deterioration. And then we have what's called ESA. ESA is the cumulative truck that are actually used um, that roadway. And then we have density when you compact what was the density and then the age. So we look at all these factors and our variable we are monitoring is the, how much along the wheel path, how much is the crack per unit area. So we initially look at um, these um, ML models, and you can see there are pros and cons in terms of the R complex, how scalable, and how versatile. So this is from the random forest and extra trees. Age was considered having the most important factor, ESA, which is how much traffic actually truck has used that segment since it was constructed. And then you look at also the voids and um, temperature when it was constructed and number of layers. Those are the things that actually gave you uh, more factors. And they went to, neuro, you look at neural networks also, and uh, it gave us very good results. And uh, some of them are shown on the poster um, as you come in. Now, we look at um, traditional uh, machine learning tech. People have mentioned today, which I think that's one of my concerns as a, as a researcher, because I've done a lot of the traditional methods of using regression, Markov chain, semi Markov, which I have control over the algorithms, over the methodology, but I still believe most of the ML looks like a black box where the decision maker has no involvement, just you have to trust the results. So that's one concern. Also, uncertainties. Most of the other models can do sensitivity analysis and see, you know, uh, some of the variables that may influence, just like in regression, you can influence um, your, uh, your results. And one thing I can back up, let me backtrack a little bit, is there's an overlap. When you talk about regression, sometimes some people still consider it to be part of machine learning, like logistic uh, regression. Um, so a little overlap over there. So now, what do we recommend? From well, maybe two, two years ago, people start thinking about, actually, let's include the mechanics of the process, meaning that, okay, if you're going to... Uh, uh, schedule, uh, sorry, model the duration of a particular object, what actually causes it? An example is corrosion. You see all these cracks and corrosion on the bridges. There's a mechanism for corrosion. You know, water gets in there with salt. It's going to lead some chemical reaction, electrolysis. If we can look at what actually happened in, in the physics of that process, how can we modify ML uh, techniques to reflect that? So there are three Three things I'm going to talk about. There's one called knowledge-informed knowledge machine learning, theory-inspired 
machine learning and physics informed neural network. So we actually look at a phys uh, physics informed network. To me, they look similar, uh, except that maybe most of the time physics, physics informed neural network has to do with partial differential uh, equations. So that's what I see is unique about it. So I'm gonna talk about the first one. Um, this first application, which we're gonna be implementing in our, in our project is the, um, the Markov, this, what you see here is, you know, I don't want to get too mathematical, but what you see here is like a transition matrix, which means you have different states that an element could be in. This, this case is M state. So what you see in the, each of those elements are the, just the time, uh, the, the transition time function for each of them. And from this, you actually can use it to calculate the probability of, of, of your element, like your pavement, being in a state at a uh, time t, meaning you have maybe you have four different states. Excellent, very good, poor, and uh, fair and poor. In maybe two years, where would my element be? So you can use this to, um, to estimate that. So this has some physics behind it. So, um, so basically, this is from uh, an existing uh, paper. This concept is very, very unique because what we try to do here is you have a partial differential equation uh, for a Markov chain that can actually used to be predicted. You can use it to predict the next state of, uh, 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 of the elements. Also, you can have your data that you can train. If you have a data of when each of those states, uh, the bridges or the uh, payments were, you can look at that data and, you, and form a neural network. And what you have here, the number of the output um, elements are going to be, uh, in this case, M states. So the point is that you actually look at your physics, which is your partial differential equation, and try and compare it to your neural network that you train on the data. And then you have a loss function, which I think I showed here. And then you try to minimize that loss function. When you do that, your results of your probability of being in each state will be uh, optimal and it will be a better machine learning result than using the traditional one. So this is an example from, uh, from the uh, literature. You have something that could be in uh, four different states. You have those transition functions. And from that, you can, you can actually use this and um, find your optimal results for the probability of the states. And then you have uh, this. So this, yes. So this shows you that you can be in that state using that uh, technique. So very good technique. And then you also have this. Um, it's called knowledge informed uh, machine learning, which is also similar to the physics informed, except that in this case they use reliability. You use the failure characteristics to actually influence your uh, loss function, uh, and then that will also give you a better result. And lastly, this is theory inspired machine learning which is um, a little bit more generic. And um, this, this chart is showing you how you actually, you can have a feature engineering to pre-process your data before you actually um, do it um, in the ML. And this is what we're doing right now. We actually are programming this. We are looking at, looking at three attributes that we want to uh, use the knowledge inform information on. Age, as the pavement ages, it should crack more. Uh, cumulative truck load, the more you have truck loads on the pavement, it should crack more. Number of layers, the, the more you actually repair, put more layers on your pavement, the less it will crack. So we had loss function to reflect that. And these are some of the results and we shown on the poster also. And these are the comparison of models. The, the um, physics, inf physics informed models are doing much better than the traditional ML techniques. And so in summary, uh, national roadways and bridges are in bad condition and we have limited budget to address them. So we need very efficient um, pavement performance models uh, using ML. Data-driven solutions are the most stable because if you base everything on just subjective decision or just traditional models, uh, it's going to be faulty. Uh, so traditional models are still good. They're based on mathematical models and they're manageable by the decision makers. But machine learning models, I believe, we complement those performance models by incorporating the real mechanics of the process that is causing the deterioration. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And uh, on on behalf of everybody who has to uh, use the roads pretty regularly, being someone who drove from Tallahassee to Miami more than I wanted to, you know, thank you for keeping these roads uh, endurable. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions uh, for Dr. Sobanjo? So comparing the uh, the non neural network techniques, the earlier techniques like the Markov chains and and, and the, the K means to uh, neural networks, what's what's your experience so far? How do the new methods compare to the old methods? Um, let me see how to put it. Um, to be candid, I think the ML, the neural networks give you, I mean, you can put in a lot of variables into it. Uh, you can put temperature, you can, I mean, you can put so many things and it will give you almost a perfect um, uh, result. But the Markov chain is kind of limited because it's, you look at just the age. You look at the age, so you cannot put as many explanatory variables into the Markov chain compared with uh, a neural network where you just have so many things and then before you add many things and it will give you the result. Um, but my concern really is not just the accuracy, but when I go talk to like maybe the Secretary of Transportation and they want to know what's going on and he just gave me a black box, like if you use this new network, if you put so many things, it will give you perfect results. And then you know, you can't, they can't even modify it or anything like that. So I have a, a quick question. Um, in some of the various modeling schemes that you were presenting there, there are numerous uh, variables that were important, age, construction, quality, weather, climate, and some of the traffic. Um, can you comment on some of the um, processes that you've had to go through to acquire that data? For example, traffic patterns on these roads doesn't seem like something uh, trivial to get access to. So how do you get access to this data to really do this modeling effectively? Okay, my student did. <laughs> But basically, um, you use SQL, SQL uh, models. You have so many tables, you have to combine them. And LTTP, LTPP, which I showed you here, actually has all this data. Uh, temperature, when they were constructed, and uh, traffic, and the condition. It's public, yes. I think I that's the answer. The data is already collected in public. How cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's why I think I mentioned here is... Um, is, is there. People are not using it a lot, but it's there. Mm. Uh, who collects this data? I mean, how do they collect traffic data and who's out there with these sensors and what are they doing? Okay, what they do is they will award contracts to companies to collect this data and store it so that you can do research with it. The federal government, federal highway, will award like uh, contracts to some companies to actually, investors can do it too. You know, you put those sensors on the roadways. Uh, the one I can give example is when you drive on the roadway and you see those tubes on the roadway that you cross over, those are counters yeah. for traffic. Those are usually by the cities, but it, the data has been stored somewhere that, you know, somebody can access. So the government funds the collection of this data. Yes. Oh, how nice. Uh, more questions? So you used the physics informed neural network. Yeah. I wonder if it made more sense if you use physics-informed parameter models, and the neural networks may not you know, model the underlying physics properly. I don't know whether my question is clear. So neural networks is just a generic tool. It may not model the underlying physics okay. properly. We don't know. It may make more sense to come up with, you know, physical model and estimate the parameter. Will that be better? Or? Yeah. It, what happened is the physics function uh, in this case for the example I'm showing here is um, there's what we call a Kolmogorov equation. They actually find the differential to predict it. Whereas the, the one on the left uh, is the data driven, which is just based on your data. So we're trying to minimize difference between in the theory uh, and then what you have. And I think the future, you, to answer the question, I, really, I like that because uh, one thing I would love to do is what we call accelerated corrosion testing, like for bridges. 
actually stay in my lab and corrode some concrete and steel, see how long it takes for them to iterate, and then look at what I have from data from the bridges and try to uh, combine those two. The loss function will try to minimize for them to behave similarly. There will be one that is, okay, this is what the theory tells me, and this is what the data tells me. Let's make them closer and then modify my data-driven results. This is a new area. Uh, what I just showed is what is in the literature, I think, I would say in the next two, three years, you're going to see more uh, innovations in that area. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Sure. Uh, this is for the people online, just so they can hear, sorry. Is there is there any effort to use sort of like the um, like the Google um, street you know you know street mapping system that is there any effort to do that with our roads such that you know there's folks driving the roads and you know gathering data on the roads on, on a regular basis? Um, Google, I mean the resolution probably is not good enough for the to see the cracks and everything, uh, but lidar. LIDAR is one tool that people can use. LIDAR, if you, if you have uh, maybe a UAV or a drone or something that's flying up, actually, you can fly and it will capture all those things. And then you can just image process. It will tell you what it means. There's a crack here. There's some stuff here, which would take months to do manually. It's just not fine to do that? Well, people are doing it. <laughs> They're doing it, but there's so much gap between collecting the data. And I think one thing I see as a deficiency is people doing this are mostly industry, consultants. Academics is so far behind, unless when you partner, so I partner with some of these people on research, so I can say, okay, let me actually spend time, get somebody from computer science, let's work on this. But now they, what they already do is they collect the data and maybe touch it a little bit and put it like in the database I told you. A lot of things are going on, and but there's a gap between the using all these uh, techniques and the data. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for uh, giving us this exciting talk. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Dr. Sovandra.